Sense, it's a podcast that focuses on subjects from the social sciences field. This time, you are listening to Patti Murg and Marina Mironica. We are sociology students and we want to know more about the world we are living in. For this discussion today, we want to bring attention to subjects such as the populism and the political changes through time in countries from Eastern Europe, such as Poland, Romania, Hungary and others. When looking at Romanian's political context, we can easily see sudden changes. Before the 1999, there was a powerful link between the Orthodox Church and the state which focused on the individual's life and facilitated policies that were preserving populist policies, such as the ones focused on family. Today, for example, we have the case of Coalition for Family, which gathered 3 million uh, signatures for the traditional family, which kind of excludes the sexual minorities from the LGBT spectrum. And the fact that the Romanian state approved a referendum on this issue shows the support for the identity populism. Lately, we also see in the news that more and more politicians are making promises which are not coming from the right or the left, they are just populist measures created to serve some kind of nationalist or phobic discourses. It's interesting to discuss what does it really mean to have a populist government or party and what does their emergence mean for us? Thus, the guest of our podcast today is Don Kalb, anthropologist and researcher at the Bergen University. He has written about globalization, nationalism, labor and what we call today class struggles. This year, Don Kalb is conducting a research in Cluj on creative classes. As we started already to introduce our subject, it's clear that we don't really understand and we are not really sure on... Uh on the terms and uh, on the subject. So uh, we would be interested to know your opinion and how do you see as a researcher this uh, populism and populist uh, discourse? The populism is one of the big topics in the world today. I would say it's, it might be number one topic, number two or number three topic, but it's one of the big topics in the world. And it's certainly not as a phenomenon limited to Eastern Europe, as you know, right? So, I mean, from... Brexit, rise to the right in Western Europe. Just look at the recent Italian elections that have completely exploded the existing political system. So all of this is called populism. So it must be an incredibly imprecise term, right? If Orban is populism and Five Star is populism and Brexit is populism, then what the hell does it bring together? Populism is a term that, that is about ideology and at the same time about the absence of ideology. And to the extent that it is about ideology, it has a representation of society built into it. And representation of society is one where the population, the people, are put against the elites. Right? So populist ideologies are ideologies where the people are posed against the elites. But then you have them from the left and the right. So the left-wing version of that is populist versus the elites is a sort of you know, dyadic idea, so there's two uh, actors in it, and the version from the right, which is much more about hierarchy, has three actors in it, and that's, that's an important difference. So the three actors are the population, the people, versus the elite, and an elite that's allied with a surplus population, immigrants, Roma, all sorts of, you know, cosmopolitan more, let's say, more uh, poor cosmopolitan elements. So the right version is one where the people are pro- uh, try to protect themselves via populism against a cosmopolitan elite that ally with a surplus population, or that is the population that is conceived by the people as having little dignity, having little status. Right? So the right-wing version is about status, and the left-wing version of populism is about, well, in a sense, emancipation. Taking in consideration the actual context and the emerge of political parties that have a conservative uh, agenda, why is it important to convey our research on uh, populism? Why uh, is this subject important? So what you see is that, that, the, that the political systems that have been created over, well, in, in Western Europe over the last 50 years or a little bit longer in Eastern Europe since 1989 are really being either hollowed out from within or really completely exploded. So we are at a very remarkable moment, right? And so 
we need to understand what the problems are that produce this explosion mm -hmm. of the political system. And they have ultimately to do with, um, and that is where, where labor is important, they have ultimately to do with the decline of what you can call popular sovereignty. So the idea that the nation state can actually work for a wide majority in the population in terms of their social reproduction, in terms of uh, the planning in their life, in terms of you know, the earnings that they have, the securities that they have, uh, the housing situation, health, uh, education, and all of that has been declining over time. Right? So the state is not performing and democracy is not performing for, uh, for white constituencies. And that labor is the key issue because this is mainly about people who do not have a lot of assets of their own. Right? If you are a wealthy owner of a business and you own real estate, etc., etc., then you suffer much less from being exposed to this decline of the, of the national welfare state than, than labor. So I use labor in a, in a very general sense here. Right? So this is basically about people who have to work in order to survive. I was thinking that uh, if you are, I don't know, just just a person in Romania, let's say, and uh, you hear from the news that, okay, this one is populist, this one is populist, this party is not really, doesn't really have an ideology, but has some populist measures. How this, uh, how how is this important for us to, I don't know, to understand or to to really see what do they suppose by by calling themselves populists or by being called? So if they if they proudly call themselves populists, they subscribe to the ideology of being for the people against the elite in the in the double version or in the triple version that I discussed earlier. But mostly they are being called populists by their enemies, right? And then apparently populism is something bad. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to take that. I'm not taking that seriously, basically, because uh, populism is, a, is, an, is an element of the time. It is not that somebody is more guilty of it than another. Populism signals, let us say, a structural problem in the way our societies is developing. So simply accuse somebody of being populist and another is not a populist, this doesn't get it, right? I am not against populism. It's not as simple as that. It also makes no sense to be against populism. Populism is there, populism has a strong function, and populism is in many ways democratic. If in many, many ways, very often, more democratic than the non-populist actors in the political scene. It doesn't say with this that what they propose is necessarily good, but the, 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 the sort of the clash around populism has to happen. Conflict is there. From this on, I would uh, I would like to to go to a more specific and uh, kind of um, reality uh, connected um, question, and this would be and how how would you would you see the connection between the emergence of populism and the po in in the post socialist countries, and if it's different from the Western countries yeah. or if it's uh, somehow related to our historical position. All populisms are related to historical positions, right? Whether that is in Belgium or in Luxembourg or in Denmark or Romania or in the US for that matter or in Japan for that matter. So there is no populism outside history. So, so populism is a moment, so that's how you can see it. Populism is a moment where the national historical archive is, is, is mobilized, right? And so a lot of uh, historical issues that are important in the information of the nation over time in the 20th century are, th are are revitalized, are thrown back into current circulation. Now, the position of, East, in, of Eastern Europe in this whole, let us say, global perspective on populism is that Eastern Europe is in a way an avant-garde. An avant-garde not so much in the, let us say, necessarily in a substantial sense that, ev that everybody else is going to take over, let us say, the Orban agenda. No, fortunately, that's not going to happen, even though it might happen. An avant-garde in the sense that processes here have been going very fast and very deep. and uh, you know, populism as, as, a, as an articulate political force um, in Poland and in Hungary in particular, Hungary is the avant-garde, has actually led to a complete transformation of the way the state works and democracy works, a liberal democracy. Right? It's not gone as far yet in other countries. And then the question becomes, how is it so that Hungary or Eastern Europe in general could have that avant-garde function? And the answer is, in fact, very simple. Right after the collapse of socialism in 1989, um, you've had only 20, 30 years to build up new institutions. So the institutions are, are much less sedimented and consolidated than in the West. The West needs to have a longer period to flush them away, whereas here they, you 
we just crumble very fast. That is one reason. And then the second reason is simply wealth, right? So you started in 89 and well, you, the wealth position of Eastern Europe is, uh, and, and is the, the position in, the, let's say, in the world system of Eastern Europe is uh, very different from that in the West. So wealth is here, let's say, generally some 30% of the wealth in the West. Much of that wealth is not nationally controlled. And so uh, the combination of weak institutions and um, a large percentage of people that have long-term stagnating lives, mass out-migration, all of that, makes Eastern Europe a much more vulnerable place for these global processes than, for example, the Netherlands, where I come from, but the Netherlands, but also Denmark, which are both very, let us say, happy places in a little sense, you know, in the surveys, as you know, uh, with very high GDP, with, with, with strong welfare states, they too have very strong populist movements and populist politics, right? So, so in that sense, uh, Eastern Europe has a sort of signal function, but it's certainly not exceptional. Talking about um, populism, uh, we were curious about the instruments used by political forces in spread spreading their promises and making the populist agenda appealing to the masses. And our question is, um, what kind of instruments are used, such, such as mass media, or uh, how do they spread their kind of uh, promises through media? How is the media used as an instrument to propagate or other channels and other than media. Is, uh, we are thinking, you know, about Hungary, for example, where Orban is using uh, his already heaven position and state resources and state institution in order no. to kind of support his uh, yeah, 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 his right. agenda, in, maybe in this way. Just what Yeah, but that is not... So you cannot talk about populists in general as if they are doing that. I think the Hungarian situation is rather special in that sense. So Hungary is certainly not... Again, it's an avant-garde, but it's not a model for populism anywhere else, necessarily, right? That's, that's an open issue, really. Well, clearly, if you want to talk about Hungary a little bit, then a liberal democracy in Hungary uh, is an extreme case. It has nothing to do with democracy anymore in many ways, right? Uh, the democracy is a lie there. So here you have a state and a, a regime that has been able to... Uh, to basically dispossess the earlier owners of the media, transfer the property to others that are closely aligned with it, mostly millionaires or billionaires. And so this is a, this is a typical, uh, I would say, in a sense, a East European oligarchical regime by now, where the, where the state has been used as an instrument to uh, to transform the whole of civil society, if you like. Right, and I use it in a completely neutral term here because that is not a civil society anymore. It is a very, it's a dominated, oligarchically dominated, state-run uh, civil society. That's again very different from Poland, by the way. So even the conservative government in Poland is also using a lot of state money to direct particular advertisements to its to its befriended media, etc. But but the media situation in uh, in Poland has not collapsed or has not transformed in the way that uh, that uh, has been, has happened in Hungary. Look, I'm quite neutral about that sort of a th thing, like in Poland in principle, because everywhere governments are using advertisements uh, in, in ways that support particular media and not others, right? So I, I think the Polish government has a perfect right to do that. If people don't like it, they must vote against government, but the government has a right to do that. I, so I'm not alarmist about this. I'm also not alarmist necessarily about all these sort of changes that are that are related to populism because th something has to be done, something has to be happening. I told you populism is a, is a signal that the system is not functioning, so we, we need experiments. Also the idea, I heard that a little bit in your question, that populists make a lot of promises to people. Yeah, but that's exactly what, what politics is supposed to do, right? Politics is not supposed to tell people, fuck you all. You know, it's, it's supposed to actually try to do something for people. That's what the state is for. That's what the state gets legitimacy from. Not, not from God, but from us. So in that sense, there's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with populism, right? Populists, populists can try to transform a media landscape. Uh, of course, the social networks have been very important for, uh, for populist developments. That is also to be expected. You are talking about uh, Hungary or Poland and uh, Western countries, but uh, what could we say about the uh, Romanian situation and the uh, Romanian uh, parties, who are also in some, in, at some point uh, accused by, of populism and of uh, conducting this way of politics? Yeah. So what you have in Romania is not really one party that embodies the populist claim. Right, which is which makes it different from Hungary or Poland. All of them are populists here, but they all compensate for each other, which is which is such a hopeful situation. 
in a sense, right? So, so you're not in a situation like in Poland or in Hungary, where, where one of them, particularly in Hungary, is increasingly structurally dominating the, the whole political system. So as long as there's alternation and there's competition, it all seems fine to me. The right does its classical move, I guess, in Romania, um, aligning with the church, making a lot of noise on, uh, on, on family politics. Orban and the Polish right is doing exactly the same. Putin is doing exactly the same. This is, of course, typical populist politics in the sense that it is identity politics, right? So this is, in, in, in fact, this is about nothing. I mean, why would you want to determine via the law how people live? Why would you want to sort of exterminate particular possibilities of living together? Why is that interesting for people? It's only interesting because people are producing populist enemy images, right? But nobody's going to prosper from it. Of course, the church and the right will say that the nation will profit from it. Well, then they need to explain how. And then it turns out that the nation here is a very hierarchical, gender structured thing with the church in a big role and an authoritarian state in a big role and males in a big role in the family. Well, if that is what they want, if that is what most of the population want, then they can do that sort of politics. It's, uh, I wouldn't enjoy myself in a nation like that. And I think it would be very bad for, uh, for younger people and for, for the more cosmopolitan classes and for the left cosmopolitan classes. But, you know, the trouble a little bit, I think, in, in Eastern Europe, more than in Western Europe, is the great inequalities in the country, so regional unevenness. So we're, in fact, seeing all sorts of outcomes of what, what, what Leon Trotsky would call combined and uneven development, right? And so what you see in Eastern Europe very strongly is that the, the countryside's uh, been profiting much less from the reindustrialization and so on over the last 15 years. Poverty is much more concentrated in the countrysides and in the second and the third cities, etc. And so it is quite easy to mobilize those populations against uh, what are what are perceived as the more cosmopolitan, uh, you know, decadent uh, forms of living among among students, among the intelligentsia, etc. And I guess it's possible to mobilize uh, small majorities on that. But it is not a politics that, that is going to bring anything for anybody. It's about creating enemies, it's, crea it's about creating animosity and uh, uh, identity politics. And if, if you say that this um, identity politics is more kind of about nothing, it's just creating some, uh, some uh, subject to talk and to fight, Ah. Then what would be some kind of uh, economical populism, or can we talk about something like this nowadays? Yeah, that's, that's of course the important question. So what? So so why is why is the right in this particular case doing this? I, well, I say the right, but I know that the social democrats are just as much involved as anybody else, right? So I'm talking about the classical ideas of the left and the right, not necessarily about the party. This sort of, of populist identity politics is the consequence of political parties that over time have given away the tools to do something else. Right? And one of the big things, of course, uh, that you need in order to do something in, in politics is to have an actual tax base in a nation state. If you don't have a good tax base, you have nothing to distribute. And you have basically nothing to make politics on. So the lower the tax base is, the more you let wealth just dissipate away into the market and to private holders, the less there is a public claim on that wealth. That's something that we have collectively produced. And that's why we need to have coll collective say about it. The less you have that, the more you need to do this sort of uh, populist identity politics. That is also one of the reasons why Eastern Europe plays this avant-garde role in the, in the global populist scene because the tax bases of these states have become very, very narrow, right? And there's really no comparison with, uh, with Western tax bases here. It seems like it's a technical topic, but it's not a technical topic. I mean, still in, in very neoliberal countries like in Netherlands or in Sweden or, or, or Germany, around 50% of national wealth GDP is, is actually managed by the state. And so politicians have control potentially over that if they would like to in any case. In Eastern Europe, this is, let us say, around 20, 20, 
5% altogether. But in particular, the taxation on capital has become very, very low in Eastern Europe. So, so Hungary now taxes uh, capital effectively with about uh, 3%. So that, that is giving away your, your policy space. The same is true, of course, with all the flat taxes that we've seen in the region, where they have spread like wildfire. So there is a complete predictable sequence where you destroy the tax basis of the state, everybody goes to flat taxes, you decrease and you decrease and you decrease the, the taxes taxation on, uh, on uh, capital. There are basically no real wealth taxes, there are basically no real estate taxes, etc., etc. And then at some point you have nothing else to do than do identity politics. This seems like what we can observe nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. The same is true, of course, about, about labor and labor unions and, 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 and labor unionism in general. At some point, in, let us say in the early 1990s, I, I, I was strongly in favor for collaboration between East European states, in particular for states to try to push up the collective labor claims that states could make on transnational capital. You know? So these states are now set up as, as states that compete with each other for transnational capital to come. And they do it via flat taxes, etc., and all sorts of subsidies. And then in the end, nobody's tax, taxing capital anymore at all. But what they should have done, instead of luring capital in this way, they should have collectively negotiated and bargained with capital on behalf of collective labor. Right? And so that could have pushed the labor share in, in the national wealth equation enormously. Right? It, could have, it could have been double by now if, uh, if they had done that. So labor has now about... I think in Eastern Europe, in general, about some 40% uh, of, the, of the total product that, uh, that East European capitalism is producing goes to labor. In the West, that is mostly 60%. There's no reason why that could not be the case in East Europe too. Well, that's 50% more than, than they're getting now, right? So that is the sort of politics that, that in my eyes, you know, real politics is about, not, not the identity politics of, of, of jealousy and of, you know, petty, petty trying to, to tyrannize particular populations, etc., you know, on behalf of nothing, but, but some sort of, you know, serious engagement with how national wealth is produced, how that fits in the, in the global and the European picture, what you need to do as a collectivity of states in order to, to get there, and then actually make politics. So if we are talking about um, populist uh, discourse, what are some against or contra movements to the populist agenda? If, like, if for example, populism was, is uh, on one side, what's the other side of, uh, of the coin? Well, what you see at the moment is, that, is, is how the, the liberals are, uh, are mobilizing against populism. They've been doing that basically since 2015. At Central European University, you have this... this uh, Rethinking liberalism, rethinking open society, a lecture series going on, and it, it's only just one uh, element in a, in a wider rethinking of liberalism. And what you see is that the old heroes of, of, of liberalism, Timothy Garton Nash, and all these guys, Jeffrey Sachs, are being mobilized again to say exactly the same as what they have been saying 30 years ago that liberalism is the best for us and that all the rest is very dangerous. That, of course, doesn't cut it because it's not for nothing that this whole populist shift has happened under the reign of neoliberalism. So the liberals have sold out to neoliberal capital and to, to globalized capital uh, in a way that destroyed their own political system. Uh, that, is, that is in fact what has been happening. So, so I would say that the liberals uh, would be well advised to be a little bit more modest at the moment and learn a little bit more rather than start preaching again. And uh, much of the populism accusation uh, comes from from uh, the liberal side, right? So it's mainly the liberals who accuse everybody else of being populist because the rest don't, is not buying what they want anymore. So that's, it's a bit of a childish game. On the right and the left, there is, of course, a lot of stuff happening that embraces populism in one way or another. So the idea that, that populism is not right nor left is only true in some nations. It's, for example, in Romania, it's partly true. In Italy, it's partly true. It's not true in Spain, for example, not true necessarily in Greece. You have, you have strong populist lefts and strong populist rights there. And the same is true basically anywhere else. So that is a particular position, that, that populism of no right, no left. It's a particular one. It's, it happens in a particular national system and against a particular... Uh, historical background. 
I don't think you can fight populism, right? I think you can only fight populism by by reinstalling popular sovereignty. So populism signals the collapse of popular sovereignty over time, slow collapse. And the only politics that is anti-populist in that sense, but perhaps mobilizes populist elements nevertheless, is a politics that, that tries to reinstall popular sovereignty. Now, the possibility of doing that on the, on the level of the national state, zero, right? So all the nationalists, for example, are completely, in, what is it? Uh, they're out in the clouds. Right? It's, it's, uh, Orban has, uh, of course, a great day uh, and a great year. But the idea that Hungary can be run as a completely national society is, 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 is a very big joke. I mean, 10% of GDP is dependent on the inflow of, uh, of EU subsidies. And then everybody who is earning a good salary is doing that with transnational enterprises. So, yeah. So what you see in those states like, like Hungary is a sort of is, is a renegotiation about the national pact in relation to, uh, to the EU and global capital. I think the much stronger negotiation that has to happen is a negotiation that that brings the collectivity of states in and that tries to have the collectivity of states within the EU, for example, bargain with capital. Right? That is that is the way to go. One individual state does not have any serious space for doing. It can only be a nasty sort of state like like Hungary, but it won't be very effective. Going uh, closer to the end, uh, can we talk about uh, some kind of uh, winners and losers of populism related to, I don't know, some countries or some paths of populism? Because you, you say that they are different and you cannot talk about global kind of, uh, of populism. And then, I don't know, taking the example of Romania or of other Eastern European countries, can, can we say that, oh... These are people who have a lot to, to win and these are people who have to lose. Well, in, in strictly political terms, uh, the left is basically everywhere the big victim of the rise of populism, right? And so populism emerges in many places as an attack on the left. And it might say that it is uh, not left and right, but it's nevertheless based in an attack on the left. So who are the left in that case? Right? But in ter- maybe uh, who are in terms of classes or groups of yeah. people, not in terms of big politics. Yeah, I think the, the picture is very muddled there. It's very difficult, difficult to give a general answer to that. Um, and perhaps I don't want to give an answer in terms <laughs> of classes. I, I don't think that you can easily say that particular classes are, are gaining or losing in a, in a, in a populist setup. Even though most populist uh, right-wing programs are, let us say, national bourgeoisie-making programs, right? So you know all these these, these little entrepreneurs or bigger entrepreneurs, uh, domestic entrepreneurs, uh, tend to gain from it. That might be good, or it might not be good for working classes and for employees. Uh, that is entirely open. I think the main problem with with the rise of the populist right is the effort to reinstall hierarchy, right? And, and so, so who is going to suffer from this hierarchy is then the question. And yes, that, that is, of course, all sorts of, well, let us call it, well, all sorts of cre- creative minorities, right? Those who do not fit into a hierarchical schema very well. And those who behave, let us say, slightly deviant, right? So the, the idea of the right is that there is a very clear normalcy in behavior and normalcy in politics and that all the rest is deviant. So all those people who are going to be deviant can be LGBT, it can be can be intellectuals, it can be anarchists, it can be it can be communists, it can be the youth in general, uh, or the cosmopolitan youth. All those people are going to suffer from it. Right. And but again, it's difficult to talk about it in a very general way because this is the East European picture. As you know, that in, in Western Europe, and the Netherlands and Denmark are, are excellent uh, examples of that, the LGBT movement is actually very strong on the right-wing populist side, right? And so pe- uh, populism embraces, you have to be pro-gay if you are a populist in the Netherlands. And you have to be against Islam, and Islam is against the gays. Right? That's, yeah. that's the argument. So, so again, you have completely different positions and histories here. It's very difficult to give a general answer to that. 
Yeah, we usually ask our guests about uh, a final message if you have for the podcast for our uh, listeners. I think it's a great idea to have this podcast for a wider public. I don't know whether I satisfy the wider public, but but I mean your your effort to create a more public sociology is a very valid one, and so uh, I'm a great support. Yeah, this is very nice. Thank you. Yeah, so 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 coming back to my overall message on populism is that populism is is, is a democratic force. Even though we might not like the populists, it's so it's a, it's a necessary moment. It has to happen, and the, the populist onslaught on the elites, however nasty it might look, is a necessary thing to happen. My 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 personal hope is, of course, is that that the impulse towards the right and towards new visions of hierarchy and punishment dissipates, and that that the left finds new populist ways in which it can uh, can bring a more egalitarian and a more experimental and, and, and societally open agenda uh, to the fore. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you also. Yeah. Our guest today was Don Kalb, and we want to thank him for this uh, discussion. For the end of the discussion, we want to resume some of the ideas, and uh, we would like, like to say uh, populism, for example, is the ideology without ideology. Eastern Europe is the avant-garde of populism. No one can benefit from identity politics made by populists. The poverty will not fade away by this. And we cannot talk about some specific losers or winners of populism. But for the Eastern countries, it's true that deviant groups are not favored. You've listened to Contrasense. Thank you for joining us. Our guest today was Don Carl from Bergen University. This podcast is sponsored by Faculty of Sociology and Social Work, Babes Boyer University. Today's episode was produced by Patti and Marina. Music and mastering by Kind Studios. For the recording studio, we want to thank Radio Cluj. You can also find out about Contrasense on our Facebook page or listen to us on SoundCloud. Let us know your thoughts on our email address, contrasense.protonmail.com. Hear you soon.